This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 190. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everybody? This is Josh Dorkin, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co host, Mr. Brandon Turner. What's up, sir? Hey, uh, I don't know. What's up with you? Man, summer is over. Today was the first day of school. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Is the teacher yeah. being mean to you again? You know, all the uh, kids picking you on know, you. They pick on me a little bit. Yeah, you bring your know. school lunch and your little Power Rangers lunchbox, all that good stuff. I was wearing my Power Rangers costume. I thought you were just like underwear. <laughs> That's yeah, it. Don't, don't, don't worry about what I'm wearing down there. <laughs> <laughs> but nah, man, school, school's in session. So, you know, I think I'm uh, going to be getting back to a, a, a more normal uh, 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 schedule around here, which, which is always exciting. It's also sad that the, the travels and, and excursions of summer are coming to an end. But uh, yeah, man, things are good. Things are going really well. Yeah, work is good. BP is good. Life is life is going well. How about you? Things are good. Finally got a property under contract again. I got a duplex under contract. It's been a couple of months, ah. kind of a dry spell here. Oh. It's been kind of weird. So uh, yeah, whatever. I'm getting nice. a, Yeah, that would. Yeah, it should close here in a month or so. And, oh, uh, congratulations. Thanks. That's great. Yeah, That's great. Are you uh, you you're gonna move in? You're gonna house hack it? I'm not gonna house hack that one. No, why not? not? Well, here's the beauty of this one. It's actually rented both houses, both houses, two houses, one lot. Both are already rented, cash flow from day one. Private lending is gonna fund so the entire thing. No money down. Tenants. You're not, I'm, yes, I am taking the risk. Man. I know I'm taking the risk there. Uh-oh. But uh, have, have you, you know, met I met them? I met both of them. Uh, okay. You know. They, they seem all right. I might budget a little bit for uh, an eviction at some point, but we'll see. <laughs> Bad move. <laughs> yeah, I mean, worst case scenario, I'm in. I mean, I'm, I'm actually evicting some inherited tenants right now as we speak. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's it's not a, couple, a bad move. It's, it's a couple. Just, you have to be prepared. Yeah, for you got to right? be prepared. I, and I, when I, the property I bought a few months ago that I knew I was going to have to evict them, I just set aside like three grand. I said three grand of my repair budget was eviction money. So there's a yeah. little quick tip for people. Yeah, there you go. Well, I, I, I've got a, I've, I've got do? a quick tip too. What's your yeah. quick tip? Today's quick tip. tip. Today's quick tip is check out the Bigger Pockets video library. We just launched it. You can go to biggerpockets.com slash videos and uh, find all your favorite Bigger Pockets videos up there it uh, might in be, our video library. And it might be the prettiest page in all of Bigger Pockets. They it is did, pretty. They, they did good, who Ed designed that, right? I think it was yeah, Ed. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. He's, he's a yeah rock star there. It looks yeah, good. He is. It it looks great. But yeah, so we we've got a video library. You know, so many people, you know, like, hey, where do I get your videos? So instead of sending them off to lots of other places, which you can still find our videos on, but yeah, just go to biggerpockets slash videos, and uh, the library uh, will be there. So. Yeah. It's very cool. Quick tip. Quick, quick tip. All right. Well, let's get on with the thing. Today's show is really, really awesome. It's by a guy who is actually a billion. We're interviewing a billion dollar agent, which means he's sold more than a billion dollars in, in, in property. Shut your mouth. Yeah. A billion dollars in property. That's a very small club of agents out there who have done that. Uh, but he's also a real estate investor and kind of a cool perspective on some stuff, especially uh, like how he works with other investors who buy apartment complexes. That whole kind of the partnership thing is really, really cool. I think you guys will like that kind of an angle we haven't covered before. Yeah. Yeah. He was, uh, he was the top agent in the entire world at Remax yeah. for one year and also at Keller Williams. I mean, yep. that's, and, and obviously he's a real estate investor. Uh, and so yeah, lots of, lots of great stuff. We, we, we cover lots of Lots of topics from yeah. you know low income uh, rentals to yeah section uh, eight stuff that was fun section eight yes multiple <laughs> streams of income uh, yeah it's it's a great show yeah so. his his philosophy we get, we talk about it towards the end of the show but his philosophy on like what he calls horizontal income I think yes. is something that every it's listener fascinating. here fascinating every listener here should be be listening and doing what he's talking about I think. Well, you know, from what he says, what the average person has, what one to two streams, yeah, one or two, at most three yeah. of horizontal income uh, yeah. by the time they're retired, and and you he's know his 60. philosophy, <laughs> yeah, he's got sixty something. It's <laughs> it's amazing. I yeah. love it. I love it. So you'll learn more. Listen up, guys. This is show one ninety of the Bigger Pockets podcast. You can check out the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show one ninety. And uh, otherwise, guys, really quickly before we get into it. Uh, 
definitely make sure to subscribe to the show if you have not done so already. Just hit the subscribe button on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, SoundCloud, wherever else you're consuming the show. Or if you're just listening on our website, uh, go to follow those links to to Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, you name it, and subscribe. Also, if you have a chance, please leave us a rating and review while you're at it. Let's get to this thing. Today's guest, as we already said, is a billion no he's not a billionaire that would be that would be pretty cool well, you know if you are a billionaire and want to be on the show and invest in real estate get in touch we would certainly be interested in chatting with you uh but no uh our our guest today pat hyben uh is uh has done a whole lot of transactions as a real estate agent and has changed and transformed his life and now focuses primarily on investing in real estate uh for income purposes and uh, he's done all sorts of deals. I think he's done about a, a hundred deals, is, is yep. what he said. Um, and, and he's uh, a New York Times bestselling author. So he is also There's a New York that. Times bestselling author. He's a podcaster. Yeah. The guy's brilliant. Guy's doing lots of great things. And uh, so let's get to this. Pat, welcome to the show, man. It's good to have you here. Josh, Brandon, thanks for having me, man. This is awesome. Yeah, no, it's an honor. This should be fun. This should be fun today. Yeah, so we're talking about he's uh, famous, isn't he? This he's guy. A, he's a big deal. I hear that's 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 the word. He rumor was, has it. Rumor, rumor has it. So tell us real quickly about yourself. Why why would we say you're you're you got some accolades? Yeah, well, I kind of wish that uh, I'm I'm in the real estate sales business uh, from the beginning, and uh, I wish it was a business where you could get rich without being famous. And I'm working <laughs> on that now, actually, is how to, how to get richer without being more famouser. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but it is what it is. So, um, so anyway, so yeah, so I, um, I've been a real estate agent licensed full-time in the state of Maryland for 27, going on 28 years and, uh, read some very high peaks at some very big companies. In 2004, I was the number one Remax agent in the world in, in 2006, I believe it was, I was number one at Keller Williams. Wow. Um, and hey, Brandon, and, can we get a more impressive guest? I, I, I don't know <laughs> that this guy really cuts the mustard. Yeah, you know, well, he, he did a good job as an agent, it sounds like. Uh, but you also invest as well, correct? You got some real estate investments yeah. in there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So, I, and, and I, you know, that's part of my thing is I think that uh, real estate agents or, or commission people in general, but mainly real estate agents, don't invest like they just don't they they, yeah. they talk the talk but they don't walk the walk oh man hallelujah yeah <laughs> i i've been i've been screaming that from the hilltops man for for 12 years since i've been doing this i mean it just it blows my mind i was an agent for for kw and and coldwell uh for like six minutes each was not very good <laughs> at either time and but but like what what shocked me was that the agents were not investing. It, it, it just like, I, I, I didn't get it. And, and I, I get it now. I mean, I think they just, re- most of them don't fully understand the business. They, they, they're not trained. Uh, they don't know how to evaluate deals uh, from an investment capacity. And, you know, they think that they don't have the, the resources to do it, but you know, little do they know you can be creative and actually get some deals done. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just, it's fascinating to me. Well, they tend to be right-brained animals, you know, so they're very gregarious and very salesmany and and great with people, but just terrible when it comes to numbers and operations and and you know, everything down to savings, you know. One of my favorite things to do is to pick up a magazine called the Baltimore Business Journal and in the back it has three or four pages of all the tax liens in the Baltimore area and and, and highlight names of real estate agents I know. <laughs> it, it, it sounds mean, but it's just like, look at that sucker. You know, is, like is that shit. your like your weekly yeah. social media post? Is like, is and of Pat- course, on his website, he's saying, you know, I'm the best, and I'm the, you know, I'm greatest, and look at me in this, you know, two thousand dollars suit. But here I am in the back of the newspaper with a tax lien on my house. Well, and, th- and that's one of the reasons I think so many, especially newer real estate investors, they take advice from their real estate agent who may or may not, but may have never bought a single property in their life. They may have never done anything, but they take all this advice like, oh, my agent said that was a good deal. I'm going to go buy it. My agent said this was a good multifamily. I'm going to go yeah. buy it. And, and they rely on, uh, you know, rather than doing their own numbers, they rely on somebody else to tell them what, what's good and what's not. And it's dangerous. I love, I love uh, your last guest, David, how he, and, and I'll never forget this. He said, he said, when you ask a real estate agent how the market is, don't tell them if you're a buyer or seller. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. That, that was deep. I was like, oh, there you go. Yeah. 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 Yep, I, I love that too. Yeah, that was an awesome show. So people can go back and listen to that, by the way, by going to biggerpockets.com slash show. I don't even remember what number that was. 186, maybe? We'll, 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 we'll put it in the show Yeah, we'll show put it in the show notes. Check out the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show 190. Yeah, I think um, it was 87, I think, but uh, 187. Anyway, all right, so let's jump back into your story. So, I mean, I, you were an agent for years. Uh, you obviously knew what you were doing in that business, but let's talk about getting into your investing. Like, when did you first buy your... A property for yourself. Like when did you jump from agent to buyer? Uh, uh, I was 23. And 23. so I bought it. 23, yeah. And so oh. I bought um, a townhouse and I rented out the basement to two girls. And then I rented uh, one of the bedrooms upstairs to a friend of mine and uh, lived in the, in the other bedroom. So kind of, yeah. and I shared a bathroom with my roommate. Didn't have, I didn't have my own bathroom until actually until I got married. Nice. So you, so you house hacked. Yeah, we call we call that house hacking. Yeah, yeah. I was so proud of that. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's yeah. a great way to get started. I mean, yeah. Whether it's a single family, duplex, you know, triplex, fourplex, like those, a uh, good way to get started. Do you? I mean, do you look back on that with fond memories now, or you're like, what the hell was I doing? <laughs> no, I think it was great. You know what I mean? Because I just did it. It, it wasn't. Um, I never really paid rent for very long. Yeah. And uh, so I was always a landlord after that, you know, or owned my own home. And uh, I actually kept that house up until like five years ago, finally sold it. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, that was a great deal. You know, I just kept it and eventually it was paid off. And, you know, yeah. so anyways, that was cool. I'm, I'm proud of that. Yeah. Well, that's that's one of the, the strategies that, that we really love to, to share with newer investors. You know, a lot of people come out and they're like, you know, I don't have a lot of money. I don't have resources. I'm not sure how to get started. And we always recommend looking at house hacking as, as a way to go because it's an opportunity to save on your own personal payments while learning the ropes of becoming a landlord. Um, do you have any stories from, from those days or any tips, advice, or anything like that for, for yeah, newbies? Well, well what, what pops into my head is, is an amazing story. It's not about me, but it's about a guy I know. Uh, he's in Texas, and he's an illegal alien – um, he was brought here when, when he was a kid, uh, with his, from his parents from Peru when they were on vacation or alleged vacation. And then they stayed here. Right. And so, uh, my point of this is now he's 26. So he's been here like whatever, 16 years or something. Uh, he has bought in Texas five houses from house hacking, um, without being a citizen in that, uh, he cannot get a mortgage but his his name. Let me think about this. Yeah, he cannot get a mortgage, but his name could be on the deed. Mm-hmm. So yeah. he, um, so what he does is he gets a friend of his uh, or someone he knows to to get the mortgage, right? And then they split the house fifty fifty. They both own fifty percent of the house, and he has five investment properties now. That's awesome. Wow. That's actually Good one of friend. my. When, when I had no money at all, I mean, that was my main strategy. When I couldn't get a mortgage, I had no job and no money, and I was trying to you know, do this flipping house and buying rentals and all that, and banks didn't like me. That was my main strategy. Find a partner, somebody who maybe had good credit, who the bank loved to work with, and say, hey, why don't we just split this 50-50? You get the mortgage in your name. We'll both be on title, and we'll just split everything down the middle. And that worked out fantastic for me for a number of years. Well, yeah, I, I, I think that's a, it's a great lesson, by the way, if, if a lot of people are curious, like, how do I go from monopoly little greenhouses to big red hotels? Mm-hmm. Most people that go from little greenhouses to big red hotels do it with partners. Yeah. You know, do it with, with somebody else that's richer. So yeah. that, there's an answer there some people might be searching for. Yeah. What, what I like about that story is, I mean, this, this is a guy who, like you said, I mean, uh, illegal, you know, um, and that's not stopping him from from making it happen. So if he can go and he can make it happen, then all you guys listening who are saying, well, I don't know, I don't have money or I don't have this, I don't have that, like those are ex- excuses. I mean, there's there's an answer to all those things. And it may not be you're going to buy it today. It may be, you know, it'll take you a little bit of time, but, you know, anybody can do this. You just have to find the path and there's a path for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, one of the one of the stories I like to tell people, like I do this, I say this on the Bigger Pockets webinar every week, is uh, or almost every week I tell this story. Imagine for a minute that I mean, people say I can't afford to buy a house, I don't have enough money, right? So I like to use this story. Imagine that somebody, your next door neighbor, offered you their house for a thousand bucks, just a thousand dollars, but it was worth a million. But for a thousand dollars, the problem is you didn't have a thousand bucks in your bank account, you had no money. 
would you figure out a way to buy, come up with $1,000? And, and everyone says, well, of course. And I said, well, how do you do that? I don't know. I'd ask to borrow it from somebody. Okay, well, what else? Uh, you know, maybe I'd partner with somebody, not from half the deal. Okay, what else did you do? And like the exact same situation applies to any real estate. If you can do it with 1000 I mean, the bottom line is you find a good enough deal and you're going to be able to find the funding for it if you want it bad enough. So, yeah. And there's a ton of people out there that want to invest in real estate, but don't want the pain associated with looking at houses and picking a house and dealing yeah. with contractors. So, so if you can take that pain away, um, you know, chances are there's, that's worth 50% to them. You know, we yeah. use their money and their credit, and you deal with all the pain and they're like, well, at least I own half a house or, you know, yeah, for so. sure. For sure. Well, I, I think we want to talk more about the partners thing as as we uh, move along. But before we do, what what came next? So you bought this townhouse. You had the girls, the friend in the basement. You know, you're starting to experience what it's like to be a landlord. Um, I'm guessing you got the bug, right? Yeah. So here's the thing. So this was like 1990, something like that. No, 91, something like that. And so I, the very next year, I. Uh, I wasn't married at the time, but I did end up marrying this girl and I'm still married to her. But my girlfriend at the time, I had her get an FHA loan on a house around the corner from this first one. So she ended up buying that house, which was really on, on, in both our names. Um, but I needed her because it was a first time buyer loan and I didn't want to put I didn't have 20 percent to put down. So it was 2.3 percent down. So we put it in her name and um, so we bought that second one. Now, here's a mistake that I made. So that was, say, 92, let's just say. So I didn't buy a house uh, again until 2000 or maybe 1999. So, and a lot of people ask me, Pat, what's the, what's the one mistake if you look back or what's the one thing you didn't do that you kind of regret? And I think that would be it. It would be that I should have bought a house a year minimum in, in that eight-year time frame, you know, just methodically bought – a house because the real estate market didn't change at all in the nineties. It was basically flat, you know, it didn't go up, it didn't go down. It was just there. And, and, uh, now looking back, of course, those houses would be worth yeah. three or four times as much and they'd all be paid off. So, but anyway, so I took an eight year sabbatical. I, I got into what, like everyone else got into the stock market. Um, I actually took, uh, I had, uh, in 99, that, 2000, yeah, right oh, that around was a good time. Yeah. all in the 90s, you know. Yeah, I made uh, – I wrote about this in my book, um, but I, I actually – I think it was 2001, uh, I became a millionaire, right? And I used to have this uh, software, I think it's still out, Microsoft Money, where every night you'd go there and it would calculate how much money you have. And uh, it calculated a million and 13 dollars. Nice. nice. And uh, I, uh, I screamed. And my wife's like, what's going on? What's going on? I said, we're millionaires. We made it. We're millionaires. Um, and I showed her and she's like, what do you want to do to celebrate? And I said, I don't care what we do, long as it doesn't cost more than $13. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a, that's a true story. story. And, and, we, um, and we and we <laughs> ate uh, Jerry's cheesesteaks and Miller Lite. Nice. And I actually took a picture that I still have today, and I actually put it in my book. And uh, it's a picture of us sitting there eating Jerry's cheesesteaks and Miller Lite saying, you know, we're millionaires. <laughs> so, I love but it. then there's, a, there's another side of that story. And of course, then, you know, 9 11 happened, the market crashed. So I lost uh, 800 grand. Wow. I think my portfolio was at like at 115 or something. So I was like 1,150,000, went all the way down to like 330 um, over a course of a year. Right. One year, it just, it just, it was all tech stocks. It was all margined out. You know, I was borrowing money to buy stocks and uh, I I just couldn't get out from under it. You know, I was like, it's going to turn around. The broker was like, it's going to turn around. Don't worry about it. Stick in, don't bail. And it just went all the way down. And then it was at that point that I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going into real estate. You know, I'm going to just start. I should have never stopped. I'm going to just go with what I knew because I knew real estate. You know, I understood real estate. So then, then I started buying a, a bunch of rental properties and I bought a bunch of properties in uh, U University of Maryland College Park and rented them to college kids. And then I bought uh, a bunch of ghetto properties in Baltimore City and did Section 8 rentals. How, and I did. 
I want to. Well, can I ask you how that turned out? I mean, like the Section Eight rentals and kind of a. It sounds like not the world's best neighborhood. I mean, like, what was that experience like? And do you still own them today? Yeah, I still have six um, properties in Baltimore City. Um, I try to buy. I kept the ones that I kept or bought um, were in neighborhoods where, if they found out that I was going to put a section eight in there, they would be upset. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I didn't want to buy on a block where every house in there was section eight because I felt that the risk is too high for a market to be created by investors that all want to sell at the same time. Yeah. Hey, real quick. It's could fascinating. you? It is. And I was, uh, can you explain what section eight is though? For the people who might never have heard of that term before that are listening to the show, what does that mean? And why is it potentially beneficial? What are the downsides? Sure. It's basically government uh, money <clears throat> that if you're if you're um, if you poor, let's just say, and you have a bunch of kids, um, you could qualify for Section Eight because your income, you know, because you can't afford to live where you want to live with all these kids. So you apply to the government, and then they can they usually will pay somewhere between eighty percent and a hundred percent of your rent for you. Um, and generally, uh, the people that go through the process of applying and are organized enough that, you know, because they went through the interviews and the processes and all that stuff, and they all have some job, whether it's working at uh, a royal farm store selling chicken or it's, you know, <clears throat> working at a, a prison as a prison guard. I have one of those at Section 8. Um, <clears throat> they're making some money, maybe 30 grand or something, but they're not making enough to afford something that houses four kids and a, sure. and a mom. So anyways, um, they tend to be better than obviously, you know, four dope fiends or, a, you know, a, a professional criminal. So I don't want people to get the wrong idea. These are poor people um, with some sort of job that are organized enough to pass all the interviews and things. Now, at the same time, they are um, socialized uh, in, in believing that, uh, they're entitled to this after a while. Yeah. So, so what happens is, um, if you have a problem with them, they're, they're kind of like, well, I don't care. You know, I'm going to work the system. I got a, I had a lady who actually lost her voucher. So she was getting like the rent was 1400 bucks and she's getting 1200 of it. So we're getting direct deposits for 1200 bucks a month. She's giving us 200. It works out fine whether she pays us or not. Um, and then all of a sudden she loses that $1,200 because she did something wrong. I don't know what she did, but she did something wrong and they said, you're not a candidate anymore. So then we got to kick her out because she can't afford it. And she's like, no, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work the system. She actually told us to our face, I'm going to work the system, which meant she was going to let it go through the courts, which in Maryland takes four or five months before you can kick him out. So, and she did. Ugh. Yeah. yeah. I, I, real quick, I was going to say, I had a Section 8 tenant. You had them too, right, Josh, back uh, in the day? I had a lot of them. Yeah. yeah. I had one who didn't, uh, who wouldn't let the inspectors in to inspect her unit, which they're supposed to do. So she lost her voucher, which then, of course, yeah. she can't pay. Same thing. And yeah. that, it took me three or four, I think it took me that one, three months to get her out. And had a, she threatened to shoot me in the process anyway. <laughs> Well, so, I mean, so the downside is that, you know, there's, there's lots of things going on here, right? They're getting assistance from the government. If that goes away for whatever reason, most likely because they screwed up, um, then um, you're, you're going to lose your tenant. What, what are the positives? Why would somebody, because I, I will tell you, you know, when I first started investing and I, I um, brought on Section 8 tenants, I was really excited. I was like, oh, I get a guaranteed check from the government. I don't have to worry if they're making the money. And if they, like you said, if that 200 bucks doesn't come in, as long as I paid right, I'm good. And in theory, that was great. In practice, I managing Section 8 was not something I was down with, um, nor, you know, it, it, it takes a certain kind of person to deal with, you know, the, the lower income properties because a lot of problems tend to come with them. Um, so what, what are the positives that that happen besides the, the guaranteed rent well in, in in my experience these are the positives um number one it's a seller's market right because like i can get four people that want uh, you know one of these properties when it comes open again 
uh, that all want it, right? And I can pick which one I want, right? right. So, and, and, and if I tried to sell it to a regular family and get $1,400 a month, I couldn't get it, right? right. I, they're not going to pay that. It would then become a, a buyer's market at that point. So it's a seller's market from the get-go the, because of supply and demand, because less landlords want to do it. And there's a huge demand of there's people that have these vouchers that can't find a house. Yep. The second thing is they pay above market rent. They're generally yep. paying me 10 to 20 percent above market rent. Um, That's not in every market, though, Pat. Right. I mean, I know some markets, um, Section 8 will actually pay above market. But in, in others, you, you may end up getting flat or slightly below. Right. Yeah, I, I can't answer that. Um, probably. I know in Baltimore, they pay above market you sure. know, They because they they, you know, because it is what it is. So, sure. and then, and then, um, uh, the other thing is, you know, the, the direct deposit that always hits your bank account the same time, you know, the first of the month, it's always there. The money's always there. Uh, so those are the positives. And if they have little, if their kids are young enough, um, they tend, and I don't mean to generalize, but they tend to, you know, want to stay there. It's not unheard of that they could stay there a long time. They're not really, yeah. you know, out there shopping for something better yeah. um, for the most part. Now, I just had a situation where uh, the lady was, a, a, she'd only been there six months and she was, she witnessed a crime and the a gang uh, that uh, was involved in said crime came to her house and threatened her. So she uh, called Section 8, and, and they called us and said, we need to get her out of there and move her to a new address. And uh, I could have held her to the lease, but I just felt it was bad karma. Like I wasn't going to, you know, I didn't want to. I felt bad for her. Here she's yeah. trying to do the yeah. right thing and be a witness where the rest of the city would be like, I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything. So I'm like, this is bad karma. Just let her out. And we just let her out. That house is coming on the market in, in like two weeks. So I'll, yeah. I'll rent it right away again. I guarantee it. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, so so Section Eight. There's some positives. There's some negatives. It's not for everybody, but it's definitely there's definitely an opportunity to make money. Um, r really quickly before we move on, because I I want to get to the college rentals after this really quick. Um, you said that your properties, your Section Eights, gen generally tend to be in neighborhoods where it's not a ton of Section Eight housing, and I I think that's actually a really good idea. Yeah, Wish I, I thought do. of that. <laughs> um, how how does one go about applying to make a property section eight? How does one, um, how does one do that? Well, um, you know, they they just go on the internet and they download the rules and then, and there are certain things you got to do. You got to put like a lot of smoke detectors and CO2 detectors and, and just make it safe, lead sure. paint safe, just make sure it's safe, uh, according to their rules. And then they come out and inspect it. The city will come out and inspect it. And if you pass your inspection, then it's eligible for Section 8. And there's a, there's a website, uh, gosection8.com, and, 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 and Section 8 people just go to gosection8.com, and at least in this area, and they, um, they just look for rentals. And generally, like I said, the, there's more people that want it than there are uh, landlords. Perfect. Cool. All right, college rentals. So, you know, also a, a niche within a niche, right? Um, yeah. Why college rentals? What, what's your experience been uh, with those? I've always I've always been a cash flow guy, right? I never, um, I never really bought too many houses in the area that I lived directly, like my little neighborhood, because I knew that those were appreciation plays. You know, I knew that they were stable and they're good neighborhoods and good schools, but the ratios were just terrible with what you can get for rent. So I always wanted to get go to where uh, I had an advantage. Right. And um, Section 8 was one, I felt. And um, college rentals are another. And that what happens with the college rentals is you can charge by bedroom. So whereas a family might pay twenty four hundred bucks for a house, if it has five bedrooms, I can get, you know, thirty five hundred from um, six college kids or five college kids um, by charging them seven hundred dollars each. And if you look at what it costs to rent a dorm, the dormitories are probably 700 bucks, and you have to share a room with um, another kid. Where here in a house, you get your own room for the same price. And I'm getting market rents that are literally 
50, 75 percent above market. I have um, uh, I have one deal I did where I, I actually bought a piece of land and I put two houses on it that are um, six bedroom, two bath, split four year houses. So two level houses, um, a bath upstairs, a bath downstairs, two bedrooms, a kitchen and a living room upstairs, um, four bedrooms downstairs and a bathroom and a laundry room. Side by side, identical houses. Um, I bought the land for, let me think, the whole thing I think cost me a buck seventy five a house, right? That's what mm-hmm. it costs, one hundred seventy five thousand a house. Now this was like two thousand and two. Um, today, rent is nine grand for the two houses. Wow! wow. So forty five hundred dollars each house. And what happened was both of these houses are right behind sorority and fraternity row. And, um, so we have one sorority that's been renting them out the both houses for like six years. They pass it down generation to generation, little brother to, you know, little sister to big sister, whatever. They keep passing it down. We never have to market it. Nothing, no marketing costs. And, uh, we're getting 4,500 bucks a month, each house, nine grand. Um, and it's a, it's, it's phenomenal. And some of that has to do with, they made these laws with the fraternity row where they could only bring like um, a 12 pack of beer in a month or whatever, something silly with the amount of beer that they're allowed to bring in. And, <laughs> and uh, they're like, this is ridiculous. You know, you, I think it was like one beer per person per night or something. And uh, so they, there was an exodus of all these sorority sisters looking for houses and they've locked in on these two. So anyways, I'm, I'm getting really high rents um, and their market rents. You know, I'm not gouging. Yeah. Actually, mine are, are lower than some. I love that. I That's love the creativity behind that. Yeah, like yeah, it's Absolutely. just unique. So, I mean, how do you manage all that now? Do you have a, is it a typical property manager looks after? Do you go over there, hang out with the sorority? <laughs> <laughs> you know, separate the fights. Hey, or girls, what? I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. You know, a lot of these houses I haven't seen in, in years. Um, <clears throat> but um, I, I have a, you know, I have a guy, uh, Mike, who is um, a courier for the real estate team um, that I sold in 2010. And and he's been with the team for like 12 years or something. So early on, you know, I hired him to do the property management. I think I pay him 6% um, and he does everything, you know, um, except for the accounting. And then I have an accountant that I've had for years who does all the bookkeeping and things like that. And then he charges me... Uh, 500 bucks a month, I believe for 10 houses. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Sounds, sounds, sounds pretty good. And 6% is, is kind of a steal. So that's, that's yeah. awesome. And he's happy. I'm happy, you know, so it works yeah. out. Hey, so h- how do you make, how do you make a house college proof, college kid proof? Well, here's the thing, you know, it's really, believe it or not, it's mental, because I don't, if I never see the house, I don't really care what they do to it. It's not yeah. like they're going to burn it down, right? Yeah. I mean, they might. <laughs> they might, you know, but no, so, probably not. And, and by the way, I have That's sprinklers. That's Brandon's tenants who do when, that. When, <laughs> That's true. When I built them, I put sprinklers in them. Yeah. Okay. Number one. Number two, we put you know commercial-grade black carpet in them. Um, yeah. Of course, we load them up with smoke detectors. But, but the real answer is this. We charge two months rent, security deposit. So I got nine grand each house. So I got eighteen thousand dollars of security deposit right, for awesome. these two houses, and we have the kids and the parents sign the leases. And 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 so you know they're pretty. It's pretty strong. It's a again that's a that's a seller's market. We're able to do that, um, but that protects us. I mean, we've never had a problem. I mean we've had we've had problems, but. We never lost money on a security deposit. And even if they just did headbutts into the wall with a headbutt contest and put massive <laughs> holes all over the whole house, it, I wouldn't care, right? Because I don't see it anyways. It's just a, you know, it's a business. Yeah. So, well, so we, we had a, on the podcast a long time ago, Darren Sager, and one of his big things was how do you tenant proof your, your, uh, your house? I, I don't remember what show it was. And we'll link to that on the show notes as well. Um, but, you know, he went and bought 
uh, you know, I believe he got, you know, flooring that was just, you know, super sturdy, uh, you know, extra hardcore walls and things like that. You're, you're not doing any of that beyond the, the commercial grade carpets and sprinklers. Yeah, no. And if every tenant we have to repaint and recarpet, we don't, again, we don't care. And that sure. rarely happens, you know, so. Yeah. Got it. Cool. Cool. Okay, well, so moving on back to your story a little bit. So I know uh, maybe before we get to the rest of your story, I mean, do you have an estimate? If you had to estimate how many total like real estate deals have you done where you're actively a part owner or a full owner in? Like, do you have any kind of ballpark estimate? You know, I like the number 100 or so. It's okay. it's just hard to say, you know. It's, um, you know, I've done, I've been involved with a bunch of flips. Um, I I like to sell. You know what I mean? I'm not one of these guys that holds forever. I do I do like to sell. Sometimes I'm right. Sometimes I'm wrong, you know. Um, but I do like taking money off the table, you know, for, you know, like the deals I did with um, that I'm doing with Andrew Cushman. I've Andrew and I and some other investors have bought eight apartments um, since we started buying maybe eight, six years ago or something. Um, but we've sold four of them. So we've sold 50% of what we bought. So I'm not afraid to sell. I think a lot of people are afraid to sell. I'm not afraid to take money off the table and I'm not afraid to pay taxes on a gain. I'll try to 1099 it, but if I can't, I'll just pay taxes. I don't care because I, you know, I, I think it's prudent to be strong enough to be able to sell. Makes sense. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. A lot, a lot of people get nervous about that and say, you know, I, I don't want to sell unless I could 1031 it into, into another property. You're saying if I'm buying it right and I'm selling it, you know, I'm going to sell it with enough room where it's kind of irrelevant. I'm, I'm going to make a lot of money on these things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and yeah. And, and again, I, I, no one knows with the, if I'm right or wrong until I'm 80 years old looking back <laughs> on the whole thing. Yeah, sure. Um, and I have 1099. I mean, I have Ten thirty one. Did I say ten ninety nine? I don't know. I think ten thirty one exchange. I have ten thirty one. Uh, a bunch of stuff. So I'm not against it. But at the same time, you know, if you're selling something and you're and it's at a, its peak, you know, and then you're buying something else in the same area at its peak, then it's kind of you might as well keep what you have, you know. So um, yeah. So I don't know. And then and then I invest in other stuff too. You know, I start diversifying. I think I'm. Um, thirty-eight percent. I call them combets. You know, if you play craps, uh, a combet is when you bet on the 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 roll, the last roll, right? Um, so these are like something on the come. So something is gonna whatever comes next. You know, um, so they're they're more like private companies, um, more riskier things. Interesting. Uh, where I used to be, maybe. In 2008, I can tell you I was 0% come bets, 0% betting on what was coming next. Now I'm about 30-some percent betting on what's coming next. Private companies, equity deals, um, hedge funds, stuff like that. But I'm still 65 70% real estate. Okay. Cool. And, and – oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, Take it. No, I, I was just going to say, you know, it, it's interesting because a, a lot of people go all in. They're like, I'm going to go 100% real estate. I know it. I understand it. And, you know, they say, I diversify through real estate, within real estate, which, you know, makes sense. You're saying, hey, I'm going to look at these other opportunities, uh, your come bets, and, and, and go forward with those. What, um, wh why, why the, the, the ratios that, that you're choosing? Why, why 65% real estate? Would you ever want to go below 50% or, no. you know? Okay. No, it's too scary. And I'm also, I'm getting to the point now where I think that the world – the American world, let's just say, is too uh, too much ingenuity, like like uh, with Shark Tank and and playing over and over and over again, and and with all this money out there, there's like so much investing, and these people, I, I invested in 16 companies, and I'm starting to feel like, you know, some of these companies that I invested in, the hardest that they worked. Was when they were trying to raise the raise, money. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and I don't see them anymore. I'm like, what did you guys do? I see them on Facebook because social media, and I make sure I friend them all. And they, here I am in France, you know, here I am doing this. I'm like, what the hell are you doing, dude? You should be out hustling. <laughs> yeah. You know, where's my money? Yep. So, um, 
So I actually, about two months ago, I just started saying no to everything, um, uh, you know, because I, th- I think I'm over leveraged. I think I want to be um, uh, more cash. And I did buy, uh, my wife and I bought, uh, now we own two like primary residents, one in Maryland, one in South Carolina. And uh, we paid, uh, I sold a, an office building uh, that I made some money on and uh, bought the house in South Carolina. It was like 800 grand. We paid cash for that. And I think I'm just going to leave that. And then we have one in here in Maryland, which has like 50% equity in it. And I'm going to just leave that. Um, so anyways, I'm starting to become more cash focused. Uh, gotcha. And I think that's just part comes with you know any real estate investor's life is this kind of shift focuses as they go and eventually get to the point where you're at right now. Not to say you're old or anything. I'm just saying your <laughs> your experience. Well, you, you, just you know, said that. you just said that. <laughs> that's not cool, dude. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna transition before I get myself into more trouble. And I want to talk about uh, you, you mentioned earlier that you work on some apartment complexes with some partners, some guys like Andrew Cushman, who we had on the show. Um, can we talk about that for a little bit? C- coming from the standpoint of your, you know, we've had a lot of guys like Andrew on the show who are the syndicate. I mean, they're the guys that put together everything, but we haven't talked a lot about the guys who are the ones partnering with them that providing the funding. And I'm assuming that's kind of your main role or are you yeah. also actively? No, that, that's, that's the role. He's the, he's the brain behind it. You know, okay. he, he's, he does all the analysis and all that. And then we're just the money people essentially. I mean, we, we throw in our two cents. Um, but, uh, but essentially we're the money people or we're the people that know people with money. Yeah. Okay, so and that's why I think this is this will be a fascinating topic because, uh, again, not I mean for people listening to this right now, I want to hear a little bit about like your experience with that, both from the standpoint of when I'm trying to raise money from guys like you, like what are you looking for, what makes you feel comfortable to invest with somebody, but also people listening to the show who have money and they don't want to necessarily spend the next six months putting together this gigantic deal. They'd rather just find somebody they trust. So from both those standpoints, can you talk about like what attract what attracts you to a deal? What makes you say, you know what, I think I do want to go in on this deal and put my money into it. Well, I think that the people need a track record. I think that's so important because I get I get deals all the time. You know, people. I mean, this is not an exaggeration. I probably get a deal a day of somebody yeah. uh, because I have a podcast and people know I invest and they hear me and people I don't even know are yep. like, "Hey, you know, my brother's putting this shopping center development deal together," or my, you know, blah 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 blah. Anyways, make a long story short. Um, and what I look at is, you know, do they have a track record? And and a lot of times they don't. A lot of times they're just, for some reason, think that they're a syndicate person, you know, or that they can put together a development deal. Yeah. yeah. And they have no experience in it. It's ridiculous. Um, so I think it's important that you look at who it is and and how many have they done and what's the track record and, you know, what, what are their averages and – you know, just uh, do your due diligence because uh, I've certainly done deals over the years, um, all sorts of deals where I lost all my money. Um, and it is possible, you know, that that could happen. There's a yeah. dark side to capitalism. I think that a lot of people have that wrong. They think that, you know, they can write a check for a hundred grand and, and give it to somebody and no matter what, it's, it's going to do good. Well, you know, there's a dark side, even though these little rentals, you know, there's a dark side, but it's, yeah. the key is doing enough of them. I have, I have close to 60 now. It fluctuates between 55 and 60, like streams that pay me horizontally. Um, that's why, how I was essentially in 2010 or so able to get out of the real estate sales business and just kind of hang out. And, um, and uh, so anyways, I, I think it doesn't bother me. You know, if if my tenant moves out because of, you know, she was threatened, it doesn't bother me if a kid, you know, lights a couch on fire because Marilyn lost a Duke, um, (laughs) (laughs) which did happen. Uh, But it luckily was in the front yard. Wow. Um, And uh, so. uh, So anyway, am I making sense? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Hey, so I. I, So you said track record. I I have two questions that just came from your answer. Um, what about, I, I understand that, that people need a, you're looking for somebody with a track record. So that's, that's great. I think that's that, really that would important. Be key. Yeah. So th- those people that don't have a track record, how should they build that track record? Obviously you it sounds like you're saying, don't start saying, Hey, I'm a syndicator. Start maybe buy a house or two houses, five houses, ten, whatever it is. 
prove that you can actually make money in real estate for other people on a smaller scale and then work your way up. Is that, is that what you're implying? I think so. Uh, some, some of these people I want to say, why don't you go out and just buy up a ghetto property? You know, why don't you just go out and buy a house for $30,000 and rent it out for 500 a month? You know what I mean? I mean, just yeah. get your head kicked in um, <laughs> and, and, and show that you have the, the wherewithal. Cause a lot of these people there, you know, you don't, in reality, they might not last, you know, I yeah. mean, they, they might not, you know, three or four years, they get another job. They, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like they, you, you want someone who's well, like Andrew, right? I mean, like he quit his job as an electrical engineer, whatever chemical engineer, and he's never looked back. And that was like eight years ago. And this is all he does. I don't think he's ever going to just say, I want to be a chemical engineer again, yeah. ever. Yeah. And there's so many people out there that are just think that they're serious now, but they're not. They don't have yeah. a track record, you know? Yeah. yeah what, did, I, did I answer the question? You did. You did. I mean, talk, talk about horizontal income because you, you brought that up as well. And before we move on to back to track record, what, what exactly is that? So most of the world lives on what they call vertical income, which is, you know, you get a job, you get a 2% raise every year, and that's increasing vertically. And then at some point in your life, you get horizontal streams. Uh, one is Social Security. That's a horizontal stream. You get that, right? Whether you work or not, uh, your retirement may be a horizontal stream. But you might only get two, maybe three, okay? Um, I've always be believed that you should create horizontal streams early, so instead of trading time for money, which I understand you got to do to get down payments to buy things and stuff like that, but, it's, but at some point your goal should be creating horizontal streams. So I started creating them. You know, like when I first got into College Park, uh, the returns were so good, University of Maryland, I bought seven of them, you know, boom, 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 boom. And then, uh, you know, with these Section 8 rentals, I started buying a bunch of them. And then, you know, with Cushman, you know, I was like, okay, give me, I'll, I'll put a hundred into that one. I'll put a hundred into that one. And so my goal was actually to create as many lines as possible to diversify yeah. so that if, if one of the apartment buildings went bad or one of the rentals went empty, that the other ones were, were, were making me happy. And, um, and then I started doing the same thing with companies, um, which is a little trickier because I, I bought 16 private companies or, or portions of them, you know, percentages. And I would say out of those, probably only five pay me horizontally. So it's harder to make that work. Those are more kind of like equity plays. But the ones that do pay horizontally are great because then you're like, oh, wow, this is great. I'm going to get paid this forever, you know. And then if they sell the company, I'll make a ton too. But it's, uh, it's great. So that anyways, that's the goal. That's cool. I'm a huge believer in that, you know, like having multiple, like they say, multiple streams of income or multiple, you know, lanes or whatever people call it. Like, I, I love that idea. Yeah. I mean, like what you said there, I think was key. Is like when you're younger or at least when you're as soon as you can, you just, people spend so much time trading their time for dollars right, at a job or whatever. But you start trading your time for these these assets that you're building, these horizontal income streams. Uh, I, I know I love that. So and you learn awesome. a lot with each yeah. one that you do. Yep. You, it's it's an educa it's a built in education, yeah. You know, so even if you're just looking at profit loss statements on an apartment building and looking at uh, the pro forma on it, you know, read it seven times. You know, learn from it. Even if you don't put fifty grand into the deal, you know, learn from it. And if you do put fifty grand into the deal, pay attention when you get an email as to what it says as as what's going on with the development. Yeah. You know, it's one of, the, one of the reasons I have a hard time with flipping houses. I mean, I like flipping houses. It's fun. But every time I flip a house, I'm like, man, that, that income's gone. It's, it's gone for good. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. like, man, yeah. I could have I spent all that time and, you know, refinanced it, turned it into a rental property and kept it for the next 50 years of my life. And uh, I don't know. It's, 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 always a, it's always a tough one. But uh, going back, I have one more question before we move on to the fire round. But uh, I'm curious, when you're working with somebody uh, on an apartment complex, they come to you with a deal or whatever, you're, you know, how much do you personally – dive into the numbers and how much do you just trust that the person knows what they're doing? You know, like how, how deep do you dive into that? So someone's bringing me a deal. Yeah. Let's say, I mean, let's I'm say Cushman, investing in it, yeah, like yeah. Andrew brings you a deal. A guy you Brandon, trust. Brandon's got a deal. I bring you a deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, how much of this is just trusting me and how much is trusting the numbers? Well, I do trust 
but I do verify, you know, that, that old cliche, but it's, sure. um, I, I, I can look at, I have the ability to, to look at numbers, you know, get a cup of coffee, shut the door, don't take any interruptions. That's how I got to look at them. Um, but I would say it's about 70, 30, meaning 70% of it is trust because, um, you just don't know, you know, you, you really don't that know there's things that I thought would be terrible investments and they turned out great. And there's things that I was like super confident of and they were complete disasters. And I, I've learned that I, I'm, I'm, I'm not that smart, you know what I mean? Like, so I have to trust, uh, other people. I mean, that's good and bad, you know? Yeah. It's good because you pull the trigger faster. Yeah. You know, if you trust them, you're going to pull the trigger. Um, and, and usually action uh, helps you build wealth or helps you, you know, people that act generally um, do well in this world. But at, on, on the downside is if you put too much in it, you could lose a lot. So I guess the key is, you know, um, find people with a track record that you trust even if you have to do background checks on them and a credit report on them it's that's not a big deal nowadays um that you trust them but then do a little here and a little there and a little there and, and you know it's not unheard of you know another friend of ours david osborne he has 360 some horizontal lines wow. so don't think that like 10 is a big deal right you know think like oh he's got 360 i want to get 400 you know, so, so yeah, okay, I'll put 25 in that one or I'll put 100 in that one or I'll, you know what I mean? Just like, okay, here's another line and, and we'll see what happens. So, Pat, Pat on, on this, you talk about the track record. You, t- you talk about, obviously, that, that 70% trust. Um, you, you, you look over the numbers. Is there anything else that is going to attract you to a deal? Or is it just the numbers and the guy or gal? Well, lately... It's been, you know, this is a timely question, okay, because we're obviously, um, I don't want to say we're at the top of a market, but we're, we're in the upper 30% of a market. We're somewhere between 70 and 100% at the top of a real estate market. Would you agree with that? Probably. Okay. So yeah. you, you have to be more concerned with um, – is it recession proof, you know? And so to answer your question, the other thing that I would look at today that I probably wouldn't have looked at five years ago or even two and a half years ago or two years ago was, is this thing recession proof? Is it in a path of growth that's going to happen irregardless? For instance, Andrew and I are looking at an apartment complex now that, um, you know, I won't get specific because it's, uh, I don't know what I'm allowed to or not allowed to say, but, but it's in, it's in what we consider the path of growth. Okay. Uh, because of some things that are going in that are, um, being built by the government, let's say. Um, and that's a big plus. And if, if that weren't happening, uh, we probably wouldn't be buying it, uh, because that helps it be recession proof. Um, you know, should the market, you know, turn downside, um, it used to not have to be a factor. It used to be if the numbers worked and the performer looked good and I trusted the person, you know, I went in on the deal. Yeah. Um, now it's more than ever. Now I'm still buying. I still will buy that. Um, but I'm not as excited to buy, you know, just regular old stuff. Does, it, does this make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's yeah, got to no, be in a path of growth or got to be in a, a area where you're going to see appreciation. And I hate to say that to anyone because my whole life I've invested in cash flow. But sure. I think now since we're at the top of the market or coming to the top of the market, you should invest in cash flow and also invest in a, a place where you see some something that's going to pull it up that's not just the markets. Yeah. Gotcha. That makes sense. Fair enough. I love it. 
I'm always, I've been a big believer of the idea that like cash flow helps you quit your job, but appreciation is what's going to make you rich. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so like, yeah, I mean, when I wanted to quit my job, I needed 3000 a month. I said, okay, I went out and found 3000 a month in cash flow. I mean, that it's doable, right? But yes, yes. when it's like, hey, I want to, I want to have $20 million. That's a lot of rental properties to buy in cash flow to have $20 million. So. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. All right. Well, hey, let's shift gears here and uh, head over to the world famous fire round. It's time for the fire round. Now, of course, let's get to the fire round. These questions come directly out of the Bigger Pockets forums. And uh, today, Pat, we're going to fire them right at you. Uh, oh, could you get to those forums, Brandon? Oh, you can get to them by going to biggerpockets.com forward slash forums. Excellent. And you can ask questions of people like Pat here who can help you out. So number one, when looking at when looking for a residential property, what is the key you found that's brought you the most success? Is it location? Is it the type of property? What is it that you've, looking back, has been the most, I don't know, I'm kind of rephrasing this, but what's been the most impactful, like one factor of your successful deals? I, I, I would say something that um, has a unique advantage, you know, like the college kids being able to rent them mm, yeah. per bedroom or Section 8 in Baltimore paying 20% above rent, stuff like that. I great. Love I love it. I think that's great. All right, cool. Next question. Let's say you've got a million dollars to invest in multifamily properties. Where do you buy? Or what do you buy? Yeah. Um, we've been buying, we like Georgia. Um, Atlanta is a, is a, is a great area. It's a hot area. There's a lot of people moving in. We, we tend to, we, you know, we have several apartment buildings in, in, um, uh, Macon, Georgia, and uh, some surrounding areas of Macon, um, you know, suburbs of Atlanta, so to speak. Um, so that for multifamily, that's really where we like. We, we've looked at some stuff. We had one in South Carolina we just sold. We had two in Texas. We just sold both of those. Texas is peaking. Um, and we had, uh, we bid on one in Florida last month, but we didn't get it. Uh, and, and there were like 18 bids on it. And the person that got it put two hundred and fifty thousand dollars hard down on it, um, which is pretty unheard of in the commercial market. Where they they basically said, if we don't go through with it after our due diligence, you get to keep the two hundred fifty thousand dollars. It was like a cash deposit that day, wow. and outbid everybody else. Um, and that would be hmm, maybe uh, a seller market esque. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so to answer your question, we like Georgia, obviously, you know, a lot of my regular little things are in Maryland, but that's just because this is where I grew up. Cool. Right on. Uh, number, uh, was that three? Do you consider real estate a business or an investment? Well, when I was selling, uh, and I was earning commissions, it was a, it was definitely a business. Um, I definitely, I would say the answer to the question is investment. Okay. Fair enough. All right, last question of the fire round. My loan was denied because I've switched jobs too recently. Any advice for me getting a loan approved? Yeah, that's, that, that's a great question. Um, I had a situation where I wanted to get a loan on my um, a house here in Maryland. Uh, you, you know, I did something I, – I I've had some interesting challenges with loans. Um, uh, two, when, the, when the bubble burst in 2008, I panicked and I sold uh, a bunch of crap, um, pulled all kinds of money off the table, and uh, every other loan that I had, I paid off. So mm -hmm. I had all these houses and everything in cash. Primary was in cash. Everything was in cash. Um, and then when the market started getting hot again – where I wanted to start buying again, um, I couldn't get a loan because um, I was living off my horizontal income and I'm, I'm, I'm a declared uh, real estate professional on my tax returns, which if anybody listening isn't, they should be if you can. Uh, and it allows you to massively accelerate uh, things like depreciation and, you know, you know I, I, I get a lot of depreciation off of any income that comes in to offset it. Also, some of these apartment buildings, um, when we buy them the first year, we'll put hundreds of thousands of dollars in them in repairs, and that becomes uh, expenses that we can write off. So 
to make a long story tar- short, my tax returns were terrible. Um, I couldn't get a loan. I went and I got commercial loans against some of my properties. Uh, so that would be the answer to number one would go to a small local bank. If you're in South Carolina, go to, you know, wherever you're at. If you're in Charleston, South Carolina, go to Charleston Community Bank. Um, and generally they tend to lend a lot easier than a big mortgage company. And number two, uh, I got a loan recently uh, because I have loans now. From I have a commercial uh, loan that covers about 10 properties. Um, uh, Fannie Mae you know, only lets you have 10 houses, uh, mortgages with 10 houses. But I did find a bank that uh, allows more than 10, and I did find a bank that won't even look at your tax returns. So, oh, wow. um, yeah. Nice. And so, so just keep looking and and trying. Yeah, it's out there. They're out there. You just have to find. Them. I'm sure, like the bigger pockets for them is, you know, I'm sure. If not, if I, I'll go in there and post this guy's, or I, I can text it, give you guys the the phone number. This guy that just gave me a loan that uh, that uh, does them after ten. Now the interest rate I got was six and three eighths, I think, or something like that. So I paid a, a high interest rate, but I. Um, you got you it. Know, it was my eleventh investment that had a loan on it. Yeah, yeah. Shoot me over. Put it, we'll put it in the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show one ninety. All right. So that wraps up the fire round. So now let's transition to the very end of our show, which we lovingly call our famous, famous four. four. <laughs> All right, the famous four. These are the same questions we ask every guest every week, and so I'm sure you know what's coming. Pat, number one, what is your favorite real estate related book? Other than your own. I know you have your own book, Will Which she'll tell us all about. Yeah, that's sure. right. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've read all of Robert Kiyosaki's books, but I think the one that he, he was in his flow on that made a lot of sense was uh, Retire Young, Retire Rich. Hmm. Um, that, that seemed to put all the pieces together real well. So I would say that. Yeah. Okay, I've not nice. read that one. So I've read Nor most of the Nor has anyone ones. mentioned it. Yeah, I don't think so. So cool. Good. Nice. Good call. Uh, what about favorite business book? So I just finished reading this book, and and some may say it's kind of earth crunchy. Others may say it's a business book, but it's written by this guy called Mickey Singer, and basically it's called the Surrender Experiment. And it is a business book in that he developed a software, and he had a, created a company in Florida with several thousand employees, and he was the sole owner. So um, it's a business book, uh, but at the same time, this is a guy who never wore shoes. Right, he was a it was a hippie, wow. and um, he um, it's all about surrendering. And I've always been kind of a control freak my my whole life. And and basically, what he says is, you know, there's some things that really don't matter, and just let go of them and watch what the universe does with them. So rather than reach out and say, oh, you shouldn't do that, or 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 if you do that, this will happen, or blah 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 blah, just delete the email you know, um, or, or don't even respond and just say, I'm going to watch what happens in the universe. Just surrender to the experience. Or, or if you have an employee that you don't have faith in, you know, just surrender and, and have faith. It's kind of like the tenants in the college units, you know, you just surrender to that. It's a surrendered. I'm not going to get caught up in, in they, they can have the wildest keg party ever. I don't really care. Right. I just surrender. <laughs> Yeah. Right? What? Why? Why? It doesn't make a difference to me. So, yeah. uh, so it's called the Surrender Experience and uh, Experiment. And I just finished reading. It was a good book. Nice. The Very author cool. was you said Mickey Singer. It wasn't Brandon yeah, my, Turner with no shoes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, well, disappointing. <laughs> All right, All right Pat. Uh, what What do you do for fun, man? Okay, so you know, I sold my company, uh, my real estate team, and my partner back in 2010, and then I kind of just decided to kind of. Uh, chill basically just become like an investor or I wrote my book um, now I do my podcast uh, I, I just do what I feel like doing and um, so what do I do you know I don't know you know it's funny my friends say oh I uh, did you go to Target today and and stand in front of the gum aisle and <laughs> see what type of bubble gum to buy for 10 minutes you know <laughs> and, and I um, you know I um Good problem to have. I like I like working out. I like being outside. I like hiking, um, and I like to travel. I just got back from Jamaica 
nice. my wife and I went, met, met another couple we've known for years uh, for a week there. Next week, I'm going to Vietnam with GoBundance for uh, two weeks. Um, and, and that's going to be an incredible trip. I'm going to Australia and New Zealand with my wife and kids in, uh, over Christmas. We're going to do New Year's Eve in Sydney. Um, so, nice. you know, I just like to, um, create bucket list moments and, um, kind of, uh, get the most out of life, you know? I'll that's cool. That. And you, you were one of the founders of GoBundance, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we've had like what five GoBundance people. I actually finally just <laughs> I finally just joined GoBundance, so now I'm part yeah, of the part of the cult. I mean, I mean tribe. <laughs> no, I, I love it. I love I, it. So I, I, it's I fantastic. Invited, but, You're but totally invited. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. Well, very cool. Yeah, I'm looking. Yeah. I love the bucket list kind of uh, that kind of lifestyle. So I, cool. Well, I love I love the quote. I like to create bucket list moments. Yeah, I, I think that is beautiful. I I, I really love that. Yeah. Create moments that you're going to take a picture of that's not just a selfie. You know, here's me, you know, (laughs) standing on this. Like we went to Norway a couple of years ago. We went to, you know, stood on that rock that sits in the middle of all those um, fjords. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's like in the middle of nowhere. There's this rock and it drops down like it's called K-Rock, Kerbolton. Anyways, you got a picture on top of that. and You know, what can you get a picture of? What can you... You know, here's me with this orphan in Vietnam. You know, I mean, stuff like that that you're just going to remember forever through a photo. Actually, one of the things I did with GoBundance, I was in charge of the Vietnam trip, and I bought everybody going a Polaroid camera. And I said, our goal is to leave a thousand Polaroid photos with children that have never seen a photo of themselves before. Mm, I love that's that. Cool. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. really cool. Well, cool. All right. Well, my final question of the day and the last of the famous four, Pat, what do you believe sets apart successful real estate investors from all those who give up or they fail or they just never get started? I think it's the middle part that give up, you know, I, I, and being in the real estate sales business, I saw this a ton where someone would buy one rental property and it would drive them nuts. They'd be like, oh my God, the tenant's driving me crazy. I had to change this. And they called me over there and said this wasn't working and the and the fuse box, the switch was off. You know what I mean? It was, you know, blah, 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 blah. And um, and they just can't handle it. They let all that stuff bother them. Going back to what we talked about earlier, they, you can't let any of that bother you. You just have to say, uh, like a mentor of mine used to have this saying, and his saying was, everything's going normal. And, and, and that was his phrase for everything. So whenever you're like, oh, my God, you know, you say everything's going normal. That's how it's supposed to happen. Oh, my God, the tenant's moving out. You know, everything's going normal. Everything's going normal. And if you can do that, uh, you can last so much longer in this game, you know. And that's probably the difference between success and failure, you know. Yeah. Right on. I love it. Cool. Love it. All right. Well, before we let you go, uh, I know you've got a book. You've got some other stuff happening. Uh, where can people find out more about you? You know, what is, what do you want to share? Let people know. You know that they should check out. Yeah, I would say um, Google me. I'm all over the place. Um, you, depending on what you want, I have I have a podcast. I have a book. Um, you know, I have a main website, PatHyben.com, that uh, that I'm redoing now. That should be you know, all my different websites put together. If you're interested in some of these apartment buildings that Andrew and I do, you can just go to um, vpacq.com. That's vpacq. That's uh, Vantage Point Acquisitions. Um, Or you could Google that. It's the only company that's called Vantage Point Acquisitions. Um, And, you know, that's that's it. Reach a sick... Oh, the book, by the way, Six Steps to Seven Figures. It's a... uh, a guide for real estate agents mainly on how to sell more houses and how to invest. And uh, cool. it's, all, it's all over the place, Amazon, whatever. Awesome. Right on. Cool, Pat. Well, listen, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really, really do appreciate it. We thank you for your time. And uh, if you guys have any questions for Pat, uh, you can do that at biggerpockets.com slash show 190 uh, on the show notes. And uh, thanks again, and we'll look forward to keeping in touch. All right, guys, that was Pat Hyben. Big thanks to Pat for coming on the show. Billion dollars in real estate transactions. That's wow. Lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. Hey, Josh, how many, how many horizontal income streams do you have? 
That's none of your business. <laughs> I know. I was sitting. But, I was but, like, but I don't, I, was like, I don't know what I have either. I don't. I don't think I have six. I don't I'm think sure I, I have. Don't. Yeah, they're but six I'm, gonna sit, I'm gonna sit down and count them though. Later. Yeah, yeah. And I've got I'm a few, to, but yeah. but I I need more. I need more. So yeah, I'm gonna go out and yeah, find some more. That's my new goal. I'm I'm gonna go and 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 get lots of new streams. Yeah, it's, and I love. I just love that philosophy of you know, like if something drastic happens to something, you know, if one of my rental properties burns down. I've got another one to cover. You know, I've got other ones that are going to make me okay. I mean, even like I've kind of said that in the past. I think you and I have talked about that. You you actually did have one of your income properties. I, I did have one of them burned uh, down. Didn't you? And I didn't make rent for six quite, months. And quite, this, okay. quite the story. Yeah, that was fun. And we're not going to relive that nightmare. Hey, hey but, Brandon, text. <laughs> um, uh, your house burned down. Burned, yeah. <laughs> I burned your house down. I don't remember yeah, where it was. I was, I was sitting next you, to you. That you need fun. to call me your house is on fire and then <laughs> jerk. Oh, you know exactly what he said, don't yeah. you? Uh, yeah. That's uh that's what we get when we buy low income rentals, you know? That's all right. I'm I'm not I personally like I'm not a fan. Pat like Pat's on it, Pat's doing it and like yeah. props to him. But like you know, it just takes a different type of person to do it. I I I, I don't think I could buy a college rental. Yeah. And not stop by and see that the walls were kicked in <laughs> or that, you know, the keg has destroyed the banister or whatever else is happening in there for years at a time. I, I like that. Yeah. That, that wouldn't work for me, but like it, it works for some people. And, and so like that's a great strategy for Pat. And, and I know lots of people who are also doing that. But, you know, so you, you've got to find what works for you. You know, yeah. not, not every story is going to inspire you to, to kind of do what they're doing. But You've got to take what what they provide and and learn from it and take a lesson away from it. There you go. Yeah, good stuff. What else is happening? Uh, my brother's getting married next week. Ah, congrats. Yeah, I'm going to be in a wedding. I'm going to be. You've a got a brother. Wow. I do have a brother, and he's uh, getting married out in Boston. So. Oh wow! I'm go visit the Boston Harbor. Don't fatten the pack out and have dad. <laughs> I'll try not. Boston to. is amazing. I go go I. I'm I'm a Mets fan, so all my fellow baseball fans uh, will know that this is really hard for me to say. But Fenway Park is an amazing stadium. Hmm, I'll like, have to go look and see if uh, it's the game. oldest. Well, that or Wrigley. I forget which one's the oldest. I think Fenway is. Um, it's one of the two oldest stadiums around, and it's just like really cool to go and catch a baseball game there. It just it feels nostalgic. I'm gonna go look and see if they have one while I'm there. I'm there for like four days, so maybe they, one of the nights. Yeah, I mean, if it's the same night as the wedding, whatever. What's more important? You tell me. That. We did Boston Tea Party this summer. We did <laughs> oh, nice. That. Um, just you know, get out there, travel the town, man. It's a it's a cool town. Lots of lots of fun stuff. That I will. I'll take the baby out clubbing. You should do it. We'll be clubbing. It's, 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 yeah. yeah. That's awesome. What I do. Uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, good times, guys. Thank you for listening again. This is the Bigger Pockets podcast, show 190. Make sure to check in next time on the show. And if you're not already engaged, connecting to other people on our platform, I definitely recommend you create an account today. Jump in on our forums at biggerpockets.com slash forums. We've got almost 600,000 members on the Bigger Pockets site. I mean, there's, there's no reason you should not be on there creating an account and connecting to other local real estate investors uh, because that's how you build your business. That's how you get deals. That's how you find opportunities. Get in there and network. Guess how much it costs you? A whopping zero. Create an account oh. today for free at biggerpockets.com and you can start networking today with other successful real estate investors in your area. Make it happen. With that, I'm out of here. This is Josh Dorkin signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.